Welcome back everyone to chapter 4, Harmonic Conversations. Do what you will, the vampire said. I was reluctant to believe it when he gave me free room of the estate, but his sins made no move to impede me. I was allowed to wander whenever I please. I discovered little of note though, just more books and the continued absence of dust. Nothing more suspicious than the errant scrap of paper from my first night. Despite my best effort to disrupt him, distrust him, the vampire only appears to feed me some disgusting fish and claim his song. He stays long enough to make my wry commentary sometimes and small talk other times, but in physical proximity he's given me a wide breath. Song, poof. Song, poof. He's polite enough, I suppose, and utterly uninterested in causing me harm. That was enough to move me from a cobblestone bed to a cushion one. The days soon bled, blend together like the colors of a sunset. Other than my fading bruises and brief performances, there's little to mark the passage of time. The monotony, the monotony of our routine sways my feeling of weariness into restless puzzling. Questions swarm my mind like locu locusts, 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 and my aimless wandering doesn't yield enough fruit to feed them. I'd like to stay my burning uh, curiosity by interviewing my vampire, but I'm not sure how to approach him when he vanishes after my song's final note. Besides, I still have every reason to sleep with the fire iron wedged under the door handle. Every so often I'm startled awake by blood curling screams. Ooh, blood curling screams. I ventured out from my room more than once, fire iron in one hand and my dagger in the other. I tracked the noise up of the many flights of stairs. Worried I would stumble upon the vampire feasting on an unlikely traveler who washed up the river. Then I would stand at the foot of, his, of this coffin for a time, waiting to hear signs of a struggle, waiting to see pools of blood oozing across the floor. But I was always met with an eerie, unmoving silence. I went back to sleep with my bed pushed against the door each time, determined to keep out whoever or whatever was making that horrible noise. Although I'm sure I would have run into by now if, if anyone else is living in this estate. One can never be too careful. Still, as harrowing as those noises have been, sleeping in an actual bed is actually incredible. I'm starting to feel pampered. The food still leaves much to be desired. But I have pillows, blanket, and a softened pelt carpet on my floor. A creepy estate is indubitably better than camping with stinky, surly guardsmen and sleeping on the ground. It's a hassle to shove my bed to and from the door, but I think it's a small price to pay. Brisk. Inovigrating air fills my lung as I step into the courtyard. A shiver scuttles across my spine as I settle into dewy grass. I position my songwriting journal in my lap, having recently freed it from my clothes with some careful incisions. I always get lost in thought when I turn its pages. The act of deciding on a song makes my heart swell with calm content. After choosing one of my older pieces, I spirited melody I wrote when I was younger. I wrap my lute over my shoulder and begin to practice. My performance occurred in crowded areas before I came here. I had to compete with the clamor of moving people, from pious buyers to ruckus drunks. Here in the grass I find myself not needing to fight for coin or attention. I can focus on my music and nature itself is assembled in, in my assemble. I sing softly timing my rhythm with my shifting trees and the gurgles of the moat. I like to imagine my notes quiet though quiet though they are, carrying far into the forest, reverberating down mountains. Forming without an audience. <gasps> my pulse quickens. Started by the sudden voice, my fingers slip. The next strum is this cordantly off-key. 
I squint skywards, trying to make out shapes in the darkness. Reclined across a brick parapet overhead, the vampire stares down at me with unusual flat expression. I slam my journal shut and hide it behind my back. Y you Did you mean to sneak up on me? You'll have to try harder than that if you want to catch me off guard. In an easy, soundless motion, the vampire drops to the ground like a falling feather. He sounds towards me, eyes glimmering like diamonds in the dark. I can assure you that if I were to try harder, I should think, you would not... You would not wish to be the recipient of my attention. And... I will have you know that I was here first. Ah, then I uh, suppose I've disturbed you. I didn't mind. His reply was faster and more decisive than I anticipated. My heart hammers harder than against my ribs. <laughs> what is this? Fear? Am I really afraid of, of a speedy re re retort? Ridiculous. In a vain attempt to hide weakness, I hover my hand over my chest. No, I... I suppose you wouldn't mind a free ballot. Shouldn't you be hibernating in the rafters this time of night? I don't normally perform for another hour or two. Not tonight. He gestures to the night sky. The moon above us looks swollen, rounder and larger than I remember seeing it. Even so, it's a merely full moon rarely so impressive. I part my lips to express my thoughts when a warm shadow inches across the moon's surface, spreading from left side like a cocoon around the caterpillar. Soon the moon is as red as sunset, a glowing rosy marble anchored in the night sky. A blood moon! A total lunar eclipse is the technical term, though you may call it as what you like. It only occurs, it only occurs three times a year. The people of Aluvia insist that the blood moon is a bad omen, and seeing one during my travels was forbidding sight. Yet the vampire watches the moon with such earnest intensity, a furious admiration for this contagious. It's b beautiful. What does it mean for you? Are you more powerful while it's lost? <laughs> the vampire barks out a smile, surprising laugh, and his eyes scoot away from stargazing and glance at me. Huh. <laughs> no, not at all. I simply... He folds his arms behind his back. I enjoy the view. This parapet is the best spot to observe the heavenly bodies in the sky. The ground is a, is a close second. Ah, the vampire tilts his head, watching me with an expression I've never seen him before. Confused guilt. Ooh, 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 wow. What is it? My hand twitches, ready to seize the dagger at my belt. Hmm. I... I have been referring to you as a bard and mortal all this time. I don't believe I ever asked for your name. Ah! I rest my hand over my loot, relaxing somewhat. Y you're right. We yelled at each other in the hall and never ever introduced ourselves. You can call me, uh... Abigail. It's a beautiful name, we'll stick it. I don't want to rechange re 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 the name. Abigail, yes. It suits you. Oh no, that was the vampire, so it should be Abigail. Yes, it suits you well. Does it? He smiles at me enigmatically. You can call me Lucius. Lucius. His name waits on my tongue like a stone. I never imagined myself learning it. With how often he alludes to his immortality, it slips to my mind he must have been a human man once. It's a humbling thought. Moreover, this is the longest amount of time we've spent without the distraction of music or, or bartoning. Is he even feeling affable enough to learn my name? I should try asking him my questions. I may not be. I may not get a better chance than this. Lucius, 
If I may ask you a question, please. Will you insist on making it a barter? The vampire doesn't respond for a while. Hmm. It, it depends on the question, I suppose. I suppose that's fair. How about this? You don't even have to answer the question if you don't want to. I can move on to the next one. And we'll talk for as long as you're willing to, en to entertain me. Ah. Now I am the one entertaining you. Another generous cost of nothing. What an amusing turn of events. I'm surprised you're eager to talk to me. I believe you said something about the maddening silence of eternity. I've begun to understand what you meant. I see now. Ask your question then. <clears throat> ask your question then, Abigail. I will not ask for you to trade your possessions, but I may like to quell my own curiosity in exchange. He agreed! I wet my lips with anticipation. There's sometimes this noise. It sounds like screaming. That doesn't sound much like a question. I'll rephrase. Wh what? The source of the noise will not hurt you. It is now your turn to answer my question. The haste with which Lucian changes the topic is unexpected, but not altogether unwelcome. He did sate my curiosity to a degree. Tell me something, as a bard, what do you know about the stars? A simple question that leads to a comprehensive answer. Why is play, vampire? I observe the pinprick of light above us, winking in and out of the mauve cover of night. I don't remember the last time I relaxed enough to admire them. Before my arrival here, looking at the stars meant I wasn't looking over my shoulder. I needed to watch my own back, keep myself safe and alive. Though I sang of beauty and adventure, it seemed pointless to actually indulge in such things. I was far more focused on where I would lay my head and earn my next coin. It was strange to be able to indulge in stargazing now with a vampire standing nearby. I traced different patterns in the sky, moving with practiced ease between each dot. The horned serpent always points north. Even as its body shift, its tail will tell you where you have been and where you must go. Ah yes, the horned serpent. Anything else? It's harder to navigate using the others, but I know a few stories. The box-shaped cluster is the treasure trove of the goddess Melandrel Melandrenal. Supposedly it contains every possession humans have lost throughout their lives and... I draw my finger between the seven brightest stars in the sky. That's the first king's crown? The stories say he is banqueted in the heavens. He bequeathed into the heavens and offerings to the god to keep his bloodline on the throne. It's actually funny, Illuvinia, Illuvia hasn't had a king in centuries. And it's almost certain is isn't his bloodline anymore. It seems the gods played a nice trick on him, huh? Lucian chuckles. It's Lucian chuckles. It's such a low and abrupt sound that I lose my train of thought. They may have indeed. Abigail, I may yet know a story that you do not know. Shall I share it with you? I arch my eyebrows at that. Who says I don't know the story? You're being a fan vampire, making me play guessing games. Lucius. Lu Lu Lucius, right, right. Y Lucius, you're being unfair, Lucius. Tell me this. Uh, tell me this, Abigail. Do you know the story of when the stars first appeared? Uh, there's a story behind that? Aside from the idea that each one has placed in the sky by the gods, I... I suppose I don't know this one after all. I knew it. Oh, don't gloat. You're going to share the story with me or not? He lets out another low chuckle before he deigns to continue. I suppose no one knows for certain how the stars were created, but one of my guests shared with me a tale from his homeland. Unlike the self-serving stories Illuvia dictates to its children, his kingdom believes that humans were not always a fixture in our realm. He believes that once, a very long time ago, the world existed in an endless night, a quiet pitch black guild of eternity unbroken by castles, spires and bonfire smokes. 
When humans began roaming the earth, they would hold their newborns up to the sea, up to see the divine darkness. The stars above them, dotting in skies in this peaceful, lonely world, were believed to befriend these infants and provide protection. The stars were here, the stars were... The stars were there when we first arrived, and they still persist long after we are gone. That is what he believed. Thus watching the night sky is when we are closest to glimpsing what it is like at the beginning of the world, and what it will be at its end. Oh god, did your guest earn his freedom with this story? I would have given it to him. I would have given it to him, yes. His cryptic phrase giving me a pause, and Lucius falls quiet. His gaze remains transfixed to the sky. Meanwhile, I'm having trouble tearing my eye for him, and for the melancholic air he wears like a heavy cloak. I don't know how I don't know how I ever could have missed it before, because I think this that sadness has always been there. The more time I spent here, the harder it becomes to see him as a monster Eluvia led me to believe he was. Perhaps that's what makes him dangerous. Or perhaps... I shiver again, rubbing my arms as a breeze whisks through my hair and clothes. Lucius turns promptly away from the sky, clicking its tongue at me. If you're cold, head inside. It will be challenging to play the lute with ickles for fingers. No, I, I, I'd like to stay out here a little longer. Monsters aren't supposed to watch the sky and tell you stories about where the stars came from. Monsters aren't supposed to spare your life and cooking disgusting fish for you. <laughs> the wrongness of my perception of him is eating me away. I need to ask him my question. Were you... Were you a human once, Lucius? How? It doesn't take him long to pick up where, the, where I trail off. How did I turn into this? No, I... He holds up his hand to stop me. He's not bothered by the exact phrasing of the question. I was human once, Abigail. And in many ways I still am. You're well aware of the stand, standard methods of vampire infection. I'm sure... Be bitten by one, mixing their blood with your own. Then there is usually some manner of death or near-death experience. And then voila, you ravenous immortal of the night. But I suspect you're also aware that I was not created in the same way as others have been. I'm quite alive rather than undead, and I have no sire, no coven to compel my allegiance. I was not aware of all that, but from his subtext, I gather that the uh, blood curdling screams aren't coming from other vampire. Good to know. Additionally, as I hope you have noticed, I have not lost my mortality or bloodlust. My morality to bloodlust. It was your most likable traitor in our wayward first meeting. Good. He catches himself, as if he didn't mean to agree with me, before he shakes it off. Just as humans have notable differences, not all vampires are the same. But the people of Eluvia are keenly familiar with the ferocious the ferocity of Mont Va of Va blah, blah, blah. But the people of Eluvia are keenly familiar with the ferocity of vampire spawn, who routinely raid their homes and eat their children. I do not blame Eluvians for believing the worst of me by, prox by proxy, though I do find an occasional amusement in the things they say. Tell me, Abigail. What tales are the good people spinning about me these days? Or better yet, have you any theories of your own? Theories of my own? Don't think so. I've heard bits and pieces of vampire lore, but I've never felt the need to speculate. I've never even seen a vampire before I met Lucius. There's all sorts of legends about you, but some were more akin to tall tales. People refer to you as sort of ominous presence, a natural disaster. As for you were created, as you say, one of the guardsmen who captured me, he believed you stole it from the gods. Did I? Hmm, I'm impressed with myself. How did I manage such a feat? They said you broke into the church's wine cellar and drank your fill. As punishment, the gods cursed you with a voracious appetite for the blood of your own people. Hmm. 
I've said it before that I'm not a thief, but overindulging in wine does sound like something I'd do, actually. I've always have a fondness for red. <laughs> Any other thoughts? You're what happens when a man mates with a bat. <laughs> You're the only team. <laughs> I think the first one is funny. You're what happens when a man mates with a bat. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> okay, that wasn't specifically about you. It's just something I ever heard in the time. <laughs> oh, uh, but since you do turn into a bed, I thought the idea had some merit. <laughs> they were talking about how vampires are born after a man. You know. Imply my poor late father took common animal to bed. He will be rolling in his grave tonight. Ah, but perhaps you're not far off from the truth. My mother had her bestial moments. Oh my. Oh, what an astonishing thing to say about one's own mother. Y you've tricked me into another question guessing game, you know? Are you going to tell me the truth? Or will they keep goading me to recite absurd theories? His white fangs gleam when he smiles. Reflecting against starlight. Why? If I reveal Dharma's secrets now, I fear there will be no riveting banter left to pass the time. We wish to stay the hand of maddening silence for as long as we can, do we not? Fine, we do. Maybe I ask you about simple things. I retrieved the small charcoal sh scrap I found on my first night of exploring, holding it up for him. I found this under some curtains. What can you tell me about it? Is that? Lucius moves towards me and halts mid-step, his hand lingering the air between us, as if the scrap is a loaf of bread and he hasn't had a meal in weeks. The intensity of his reaction compels me to, sta to stand and turn. After a moment of hesitation, I gently set it into his palm. Lucius practically cradles to scrap cradles the scrap, his finger passing reverently over the smudged charcoal. I just thought I was being helpful by tidying up a spot you missed. I was going to tease you about it, you actually recognize it. I do. His demeanor was completely changed, almost to an unrecognizable degree. His stooped shoulders don't resemble the rigid, dry, humid vampire I've come to know. Then again, I hadn't taken the time to know him until tonight. He breathes out with shuddering difficulty, as if his lips have gone dry, but slowly begins to speak again. Uh, I... I ripped it to shreds one night. I was so angry back then. The night I arrived? N no, this, wa this was, was a very long time ago. It was a portrait of someone I, uh, I once knew. I shake my head when he stands to hand... To s I shake my hand when he starts to hand the scrap back to me. You don't need to give it back to me, Lucius. It's, it was yours to begin with. Unless you ripped the drawing because you hate the person depicted. Do you not want it anymore? Lucius avoids my eyes, though he tucks the scrap carefully in his pocket. A pointed question. Humans really do prefer black and white thinking, don't they? He's referring to me by my mortality again, rather than my name. It's complicated then, a sore subject. Yes. Oh, he's showing his fangs. His snappy tone makes me flinch, but I hold my ground and refuse to let it show. Because how can hatred persist in a vacuum of eternity? Once anger is finished ransacking what remains of your soul, all that's left is... Exhaustion. Lucius narrow eyes at me. How would you know such a thing? I give him an innocent little shrug. I'm not ready to change the topic to myself, because I find myself genuinely wanting to know more about him. Lucius regards me for a while longer, tapping his finger against his collarbone, before he... Relents with a sigh. Uh, 
I see no reason to keep the secret from you. The portrait depicts the reigning monarch who exiled me here over 300 years ago. Her Majesty Hildegard Edgehaven. Oh, I had suspected we'd both been punished by members of the royal family, but no, I have to be confirmed. My mind races a bit to my lip. My mind races a bit and I bite my lip. I don't want to upset him any further with a poorly timed question. Carry on asking whatever you like. Oh uh, no. Carry on asking whatever you like, Abigail. Within reason, I will indulge your curiosity. My question bursts from you like water from a long suffering dam. How did you come upon this portrait? I hear it's illegal to depict faces of the royal family in common artwork. Just having one in your possession, it's. It's an open act of rebellion, isn't it? His lip lifts on one side, taking in a smudge edge. I'm well aware. What further punishment do you think the current crown can bestow upon me if they find out? Perhaps they will banish me into a different estate? Or perhaps they will stop sending me guests, hoping in vain that I'll dry up and like a prune from lack of blood and attention? To answer your question, I described her face to an artist for memory. So you've seen her? You knew her from before? What did you do to Queen Hildegard? Did you break into her wine cellar? <laughs> oh, cross! Were you her former lover? She exiled you when she caught you in bed with another! Disgusting, no! You were never disinvolved, besides. I prefer to take one partner at a time. Juggling two seems taxing at best. But based on your logic, on what you said when you met me, you must have committed a crime so deeply, grievously, utterly heinous to have been sent here. Am I wrong? Hmm. It has been a long time since I last felt like I was sitting in a confession booth, I must say. I don't miss the glint amusement that dances across his otherwise unflabberable features. What of you, huh? I did ask you first, as you said. And all this time, I have been dying to know what unfortunate crimes you have committed to be brought here. Oh, I've made a vampire feeling like he's dying. Quite a feat on my part. I sneeze. Achoo! You really must be getting indoors. Come, I'll walk with you. You'll not be bested by my distant screams while I am by your side. Yes, alright, let's get indoors. How about a hint then? A hint about... What? You're still thinking about it. You're insatiable. It's one of my most charming personality traits. Come on, let's trade hints about why we're here. What crimes we committed. Will you go first? I'll go first. He seems satisfied with it. Though he also decides to occupy his hands with cleaning clothes. I catch him cleaning every surface he touches. Like a whirlwind of sanitation. He tends to settle into one of the various lounge chairs during our nightly performance. But without the backdrop of my music. I notice he seldom likes to hold still. Well, I'm waiting on your hint. Ah! I haven't come up with my hint yet. I glance down at my loot as and, and songwriting journal, trying to remember what it was like when I first held them in my hands. I remember how jealously the other girls were when our overseer chose to train me as an entertainer. It was a coveted position, and I was so proud. I remember the crushing delusion. De wow. I remember the crushing delusionment when realized they would never allow me to play or to speak freely. The strict inflexible lessons, they were wrapped my knuckles with a cane for a slightly mistake. I remember how I swore that one day I'd say and do whatever the hell I want to do. Damn the consequences. You already you already know what I have. You already know the have. Do what? You already know that I have a dodged merchant for speaking my mind, Lucius. I grew up in a stifled home, where his attitude was deeply discouraged. 
Once I bar broke free of them, I... I didn't want to hold myself back. I was drawn to everything I couldn't do while I was growing up. I wanted to see the world, and I did. There are times I've been relentless. There are times I've been relentless, unreasonable and careless, all in the name of acting freely. It's gotten me in trouble more than once. Being sent here is the latest in a long line of consequences I've brought upon myself. I see. You grew up among people who wanted to break your spirit and punished you when you did not bend. The stifled home you describe sounds a lot like a Luvian one. You'd have much in common with the children there. More than you know. I bite the inside of my cheek, taking a moment to weigh my options. As far as I can tell, he has been honest with me. Should I not be honest with him in turn? Lucius, I'm not from here. Ah, uh, Lucius, I am from here. I'm from Eluvia. What? So you do know all of Eluvia believes and customs, yet the way you act and carry yourself in spite of them all? Haha! <laughs> it seems we are both rather insolent, you and I. They, though, sh th though they should have, give you credit for turning out as entertaining as you did. I didn't act this way in spite of them. Not intentionally. I ran away f at a young age, and haven't turned in years. I suppose I've shed that little Luvian manners I had. But you left to see the world. Why in heaven did you came back? Don't you now owe me a hint? A hint? He echoes me, holding his hand in front of his chest. He finally ceased cleaning. He finally ceased cleaning, or perhaps ran out of things to clean, and has settled into his usual velvet chase. A hint about what I did to end up here, huh? Lucian aims his face at the ceiling, as if he could see the stars through it if he stared hard enough. Um, I don't think I did anything wrong, Abigail. You don't? After I made myself vulnerable, I told him where I'm from and detailed the shortcomings of my personality, the nerve! What does it even mean? You don't think you did anything wrong? How does it qualify as a hint? That doesn't! I falter as I notice that Lucian isn't arguing with me, overlooking my way. Will you play me the song you were practicing outside, Abigail? I fear we do not have all night in the world. I will be forced to return to my coffin before long. Forced, you say? Forced? You say it as if you can't sleep in a bed with the curtains drawn shut. I would if I could, Abigail. I dearly miss sleeping in a bed. Wait, you actually can't sleep in a bed? Why not? Questions and questions. Despite his gripping, Lucian does not leave me in suspense. Vampires are prone to compulsion. Universally, they cannot enter one's home without an invitation, and they cannot set foot across running water. I hear some vampires are even compelled to count spillet seed and grain, or to count the holes in a fishing net. I have an additional compulsion, a curse. Courtesy of Her Majesty Hildegard Edgehaven. When she had exiled me, she also used sorcery to bind me to a coffin. I cannot stray far from its less. I cannot. When she exiled me, she also used sorcery to bind me to my coffin. I cannot stray far from it lest my inside twist upon themselves, strangling me from within. The first night I resisted the coffin call and slept in a separate chamber, I woke up vomiting blood. Naturally, this is far from my ideal. I need to retain all the blood I have. You ask me if I hated the subject and the portrait. While it's true that my anger has faded into exhaustion, I do still find her abominable. She knew how I despise tight spaces. Oh god, Lucius, that's terrible. Terrible enough for us. Terrible enough? For us to move on to your nightly performance? Yes, of course. Forgive me. I clear my throat, brushing my finger over my neck. What are you doing now? 
Is that where you like me to bite you? I yanked my head away from my neck as if I touched a hot pen. Lucius! I jest, I jest. If I bit you there, you would die from a blood loss. Though I would bite you if you asked me of it. Are you so certain that you're not interested in eternal life? You keep talking like a man who no longer wants to hear a song. Lucian raises his hands in surrender. Though I catch a sight in his shoulder still quacking with amusement. Ooh, that was a fun chapter, I liked it! Oh, chapter 5! Yeah, we will leave it hanging here guys, chapter 5 is for the next episode. Thank you very much for watching, hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel guys if you like this video, help us grow so you can see more amazing story games and videos like this one guys. And I will see you next episode. Thank you very much, have a good day everyone.